In March 1920, according to some sources, 1921, in an ordinary peasant family, an ordinary girl was born, who was named Antonina. The Perfiona family in which Antonina was born lived in the village of Malaya Volkova, Smolensk region. When, like all Soviet children, Antonina went to school, due to shyness she indistinctly pronounced her last name. The teacher even had to ask the girl twice, but still didn't get the clear answer. Yes, she is Makarova, the other kid shouted, referring to the name of her father, Makar Perfurnov. In Russian villages, it was traditional to name children by their father's name. A young teacher from the city apparently did not know this village feature and wrote down the girl as Makarova. Since then, according to all school in certification documents, she was identified as Antonina Makarova. War the outbreak of the war found Antonina in Moscow, where she studied after school. Like most Komsomol members of that time, she enrolled in courses for machine gunners and nurses at the same time. Inspired by a patriotic impulse, she signed up as a volunteer. And since she was already an adult, after completing the courses, she was sent to the front in August 1941. Antonina's initial position was as a bartender in a military unit. Here she received the rank of junior sergeant. However, the situation at the front became more complicated and Makarova was sent as a medical instructor to the 422nd Regiment of the 117th Infantry Division of the 24th Army of the Reserve Front. In October 1941, the troops of the Western Reserve and partially Bransk France fought heavily battles and were encircled in the infamous Vesma Cauldron. At the end of October, Sergeant Makarva, together with several other soldiers, were captured. The Germans built field camps for prisoners rather hastily, so it was possible to escape from them. Which is what many prisoners did. Antonina also took advantage of this opportunity and together with the soldier by the name Sergei, or according to some sources, Nikolai Fedorchuk. However, unlike many others who escaped from German captivity, Fedorchuk and Makarova didn't return to their troops but decided to make their way closer to Fedorchuk's native place, the village of Krasny Well in the Bransk region. From Makarova's testimony over the course of several weeks of travel, they became close and even fell in love with each other. In any case, we can assume that it was she who fell in love with him, since having reached Nikolai's, let's call him this way, native village, Antonina learned unpleasant news from her beloved. It turned out that he was married and had children. So Makarova became unwanted and superfluous to the deserter soldier. Out of despair, Antonina did not know what to do, and in search of shelter began to wander around the village. Sooner or later, a woman took her in. But not for long. Either it was a conflict about a man or some other reason, but the woman soon kicked Antonina out the door. She continued to wander from village to village, offering herself to local men for food and drink. So peasants, policemen, and in general anyone who could provide shelter, at least temporarily, took advantage of this. So eventually, Makarova reached a larger settlement called Lokat. The path to punitive. By this time, in part of the territory of the Bryansk, Kursk and Oral regions, from several districts, local policemen and activists had created a kind of autonomy, the so-called Lokat Republic, at the head first with Konstantin Voskoboynik, and after his death at the hands of partisans, Bronislav Kaminsky. This quasi-state had its own army, Russian National Liberation Army, Rona, not to be confused with General Vlasov's Ra. The main task of this notorious autonomy was to fight partisans, ensure internal order and safe roads for German troops and rear services. And of course supplying the German army with food. For this the German did not interfere in the internal affairs of the pseudo-republic. The center of this collaborationist territorial formation was the village of Lokat. Here Antonina was detained by a police patrol, however not finding her a partisan, they allowed the woman to settle in the village. She quickly began affairs with local police officers planning to enlist their support. The policemen, like the Rona soldiers and the Germans, were ready to give Makarova food and drink for the services provided, but nothing more. Once while drinking strong drinks with a group of policemen and Rona soldiers, Makarova was asked if she knew how to handle a machine gun. Antonina nodded. She did not hide her skills from the policemen. Even during the first interrogation, she told that had completed a machine gun courses. The Rona soldiers took her out into the yard, where a Maxim machine gun was already installed. And from the approaching truck, they unloaded the arrested partisans and members of their families, among whom were women and children. 
Come on, show what you can do, the policeman demanded. Or are we feeding you for nothing? The girl drank vodka and went to the machine gun. The burst, the second, the third. McCurva frantically pressed the machine gun trigger until the last person fell. The next day, a Rona officer announced to her that she was enlisted in the firing squad with a salary of 30 Rymarks for each execution day. The pay was generous, and there was a lot of work. Neither the policemen nor the Germans wanted to deal with this every day, so McCarver became a godsend for them. She quickly got involved into this work. Stable position, good salary. The locket bosses even provided her with housing, a separate room at the stud farm where prisoners were kept before execution. Local collaborators tried very hard to be faithful and devoted to the Germans, or rather be their lackeys. Therefore, they brutally dealt with partisans and underground fighters. The Germans brought partisans and hostages to them for punishment even from neighboring areas outside the locked republic. So, Tonka, the machine gunner, that's what the policeman and German jokingly called her, always had a job. This bloody work did not bother Makarova at all. She was allowed to take the things she liked from the unfortunate people she killed. Tonka lived quite well at the expenses of her victims. She, without any shame, wore the things of those she killed and even bragged about whatever new trinket she had in front of her many lovers. Being neat from birth, Antonina carefully looked after her machine gun. She cleaned and lubricated it so that her tool of labor was always ready. Again and again she went to the execution yard in order to send her former compatriots to the next world. She killed men, women, old people, children, including infants. In total, about 1,500 people became victims of Tonka the machine gunner. However, several small children managed to survive. Their parents apparently shielded them with their bodies. Usually, Tonka walked around with a pistol and finished off victims who showed signs of life. But that time, something distracted her. Local residents whom the traders rounded up for cleaning and transporting bodies did not give up the children, hid them and then transported them to the partisans. After release. Everyone in the area already knew Tonka the executioner. The partisans declared a hunt for her, but they were never able to get closer to the killer. Tonka was careful and didn't usually go beyond Lockhart. However, everything ends at some point. In 1943, the Red Army began to quickly liberate the lands occupied by the Nazis. Traders from Rona were transferred to Belarus. Tonka also wanted to be with them, but she fell ill with syphilis and was sent to the hospital for treatment. The Red Army continued to advance and Tonka had to flee. On the way, she had an affair with a German corporal cook who took her to Poland. But the corporal soon died and the Germans sent Tonka to a concentration camp. Perhaps she even wished for it herself. After a short time, the concentration camp was liberated by the Red Army. In the temporary chaos, Makarova managed to forge documents proving that she was worked as a nurse in a Soviet hospital until 1944, when she was captured. Or maybe she had prepared documents for herself in advance, just in case. She had a skill already to survive in any situation. There, in Prussia, Antonina was re-enlisted as a nurse in a field hospital, where a young fighter, Victor Ginsburg, who was recovering from a wound, fell in love with her. They quickly got married and Antonina Makarova became Antonina Ginsburg. Exposure and Execution At the end of the war, the Ginsburg family first came to Victor's hometown of Politsk. Here, it turned out that the Victor's entire Jewish family had been killed. Victor had a hard time with the death of his relatives. Apparently, that's why the young people moved to the city of Lipel, not far from the Victor's hometown. The war hero Victor Ginsburg, of course, hated the Nazis who killed his family and brought so much grief to his country. However, he could not even imagine that every night he was lying down next to a terrible fascist monster in the image of a pretty woman, his beloved wife. Antonina Ginsburg gave birth to two children. She worked at a local factory. Sometimes she was even invited to school to talk about her frontline past. For a long time, KGB investigators could not get on the trail of the bloody executioner. Antonina's change of surname in childhood also brought confusion. An accident helped. In 1976, in the city of Bransk, a man had a fight with the local citizens Ivanin. When the police arrived, the man explained that he identified Ivanin as the former head of the Lockhart prison during the occupation. During interrogation, Nikolai Ivanin also talked about Tonka the machine gunner, whose last name was Makarov. Investigators took up the case again, checked thousands of Makarovs, but to no avail. They did not know that Makarova was Parfenova from birth. And here chance helped again. 
One of the Parfenov brothers was going abroad in the questionnaire listing his relatives indicated that one of his sisters from school bore the surname Mokarova due to a mistake made at school. The KGB paid attention to this and began to search not by birth certificate but by school and Komsomol documents. So after doing a lot of painstaking work, KGB investigators finally found Antonina Ginsburg. However, there was a lack of evidence. So then the operatives gradually began to show Antonina to the witnesses. She was even called to the military registration and enlistment office to fill out documents supposedly to award her as a veteran. Ginsburg Makarva never suspected anything. For almost a year, investigators collected and verified all the data, so as not to accuse an innocent person of a terrible crime. Eventually, when all the evidence and testimony came together, an arrest warrant was issued. When the middle-aged woman was stopped on the street by people in civilian clothes, who showing their badges offered to follow them, Makara was not even surprised, as if she had been waiting for disclosure for all these years. During the investigation and trial, Antonina behaved calmly. She talked about her monstrous crimes as if it were something every day. She had one explanation for everything. She just wanted to survive. Until the last moment she hoped that she would be forgiven and not punished very severely. After all, so many years had passed. However, the statute of limitation did not apply to the crimes of the monster woman. Victor Ginsburg at first did not believe that his wife was a criminal. He went to the authorities and wrote complaints. When Ginsburg was given the opportunity to familiarize himself with the case materials and see the witnesses, he turned gray overnight. The Ginsburg family disowned their wife and mother. Victor gathered the children and they left for another place. On November 20, 1978, the court sentenced Antonina Makarova Ginsburg for the atrocity she committed to capital punishment execution. At 6 o'clock in the morning, August 11, 1978, after the courts of all instances rejected requests for clemency, the sentence against Makarova Ginsburg was carried out. This is how Tonka the Machine Gunner, a bloody monster in female form, ended her days.